Hey Summit, first of all, I wanna tell you thank you for an absolutely incredible week last week with our Serve RDU. We had so many volunteers come out and put in a record number of hours as we served um, our city in over 40 different projects that we have long-term relationships with. Um, you made the gospel famous in our city last week and we are continuing to get um, the most incredible stories back in of how God used um, you through that process. You'll hear some of, the, some of those stories in the weeks to come, but I just wanna tell you thank you for serving so faithfully uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and, uh, and our city. Now, I know that many of you are starting to ask the question, is JD actually still our pastor? Where is he? Um, right now, as, uh, as you are, are listening to this, I am on the other side of the world uh, ministering to a group of about 1,500 or so missionaries in a, um, every three years, they get together several of the IMB missionaries and uh, we'll have a time of spiritual renewal and emphasis. Many of these people are people that come from this church, um, plus a, a large number of others. And I'm teaching them in the mornings, um, uh, giving them a, a renewed vision for the world, a, a, um, hopefully a love for the gospel, a, a passion for, for God and what he's doing. So I would love for you to pray with me during these days that God would, would use me to um, let them see the largeness of God and Jesus' great love for them and the world. Um, so I look forward to being back with you next week to pick back up with our Christ is Better series to the book of Hebrews. Got some stuff that God has really been doing on my heart and has, has, has laid upon my heart that I can't wait to share with you. Uh, but this weekend, we have the privilege as a congregation to hear from one of the most gifted young men that I have met in a long time, uh, Trip Lee. Trip is a, uh, a leader in a new movement in the United States. Uh, it's a, it's a, a Christian hip hop movement uh, but one in which the gospel is central and it is dominant in the lyrics that are given. Um, it is incredible. He is an incredible musician, uh, but he's also a very gifted pastor, teacher, and theologian. And so uh, I am very honored and excited that he would come and spend a weekend with us um, just teaching us about the Word of God and the experiences that God has given him. So if you would, at all of our campuses, if you would put your hands together and welcome to our pulpit, Trip Lee. Hello, hello, how you doing? Good, good, I'm doing good. Uh, welcome, I'm, I'm very excited to be here with you guys today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I, I've been encouraged by you guys from afar, uh, encouraged by JD's teaching, uh, encouraged to hear about what the Lord is doing here. I have a friend who's a member here, and just encouraged to hear about your commitment to the gospel and your commitment to the gospel getting out. And uh, I just wanna say thank you for having me this weekend. Uh, before I came, they, they sent me an email and they said, hey Tripp, we're a pretty relaxed congregation. You can wear whatever you want. Uh, but I, I didn't want to get tricked, so I went and made sure online. I wanted to look at some videos, you know. <laughs> Sometimes people will say we're really casual, and that just means we just don't wear ties, and then I show up in a T-shirt, and I look crazy. So went online to check, and I saw the video. J.D. had the sleeves rolled up, and he, he just had a coffee table just holding the moleskin talking. So I was like, all right, I think I can be comfortable. I think we're good. So I want to say thank you for having me. And I'll pray and we can just dive right into God's word. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, the matchless name of Jesus, knowing that's the only way we can come before you. Uh, and we thank you, God, for this opportunity to worship you. We thank you uh, for giving Jesus, and we thank you for your word. And we pray, God, that you would, by your spirit, do a work in our hearts uh, today, Father. We pray you would speak to us from your word. Uh, we don't. Uh, there's nothing that, that I can do. My words won't change anybody's heart, but yours will. And we pray your spirit would do work. Give me grace, Lord, to preach with boldness and truthfulness and clarity. And I pray Christ would be exalted. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so I want to begin our time just by, by talking about stories. Uh, stories are something that they've just been part of mankind ever since the beginning. We tell stories, and we have lots of different kinds of stories, but they all have some common themes. So we have, you know, we have love stories, and we have comedies, and we have tragedies, and then we have the mixture of all of those in one known as romantic comedies. But no matter what kind of stories we're telling, there are a couple of themes that always show up. And two of those themes are good and evil. No matter what kind of story there is, it's usually good and evil. Uh, and you're always hoping that the good wins. I mean, you think about maybe some of your favorite movies, maybe Braveheart, which is a good man movie. 
You love Braveheart. You have William Wallace, and you like this guy, and he has the integrity, and he has the courage, and you're just hoping that he's able to, to win that war. And then you have uh, the English, and those are the bad guys, and King Edwin, and you want him to defeat them. You want good to win. Maybe Chronicles of Narnia. You have Aslan, and you have the kids, and you want them to de defeat the wicked white witch. She's evil. They're good. You want good to win. Or even Disney movies, like Aladdin. Don't front like you don't know about Aladdin. You know. Our Prince Ali, 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 you know what's up. <laughs> Aladdin, you have, you have Jafar and Aladdin, and they're the good guys. And then you have, and, oh, what, Aladdin and the genie. Maybe I don't know Aladdin. You got Aladdin and the genie, and Jafar is the bad guy. You want good to win. This is always how it is. It's good and evil, and you hope good wins. But when we start to think about God and Jesus, sometimes, you know, we think in those same categories. So a lot of people think about the world as uh, really just this cosmic battle between good and evil. And, and really, you got to wait till the end of the story to see who really wins. Uh, so the question I want to ask, and I want to look at the text and ask the question, how do good and evil actually relate in our world? Is Jesus just another good character in the story that we're hoping can win in the end? What does good and evil actually look like? And so I want to look at the text and think about that. And what I want to suggest is there is this battle going on between good and evil, but it's not a fair fight, and there's no question about who wins in the end. Uh, so if you open up to Mark chapter 5, we can get started. While you're turning into Mark 5, I want to just get us a little bit accustomed to where we are in Mark's gospel. Uh, just before the story we're about to read, Jesus is he's, he's teaching right by the sea, and there's a big crowd there. And then him and his disciples hop on the boat. And on the boat, they're riding in the sea, and this crazy windstorm comes. And the disciples are freaking out. They're thinking they're about to die. Everything is going poorly. Jesus, on the other hand, is chilling. And so they're like, Jesus, please help us. We, we need to get everything together. And Jesus simply says the words, peace, be still. And the wind and the waves are calm. So now the disciples are like, well, who is this guy that even the winds and the waves obey him? And so they, they get on the sea and they face opposition, and then Jesus calms it with his words. But as soon as they step off the boat, they're faced with more opposition. And that's where we'll find ourselves. Mark chapter 5, we'll start at verse 1. It says, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. But he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged them earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how, the, how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. It's the word of God. 
This is what I want to do. I want to walk through this text, and I just want to draw your attention to a couple parts of it. All right. Number one, Jesus encounters the demon-possessed man. Jesus encounters the demon-possessed man. So as soon as Jesus steps out of the boat, they're met by this man with an unclean spirit, which is just basically another way to say a demon. This man was possessed by a demon. And so the, the description that the text gives of this man is, is, is frightening. It says he, he lived among the tombs. It seems like he, he preferred the company of dead bodies to the company of living people. It says he had this superhuman strength. He was so strong that they tried to bind him with chains and shackles, but he just broke them over and over again. It says he was constantly screaming and and crying out. It says he was bruising himself and cutting himself. This man that the text talks about is disturbed. Now, it's kind of hard for us in our day to to think about this kind of demonic torment. One, because a lot of us just don't believe in the supernatural like this anymore. It can't be proved. It's a little too spooky. Others of us, it's not that. It's just we've never really seen it before, so we don't really know how to respond to it. But whenever we come across something in the Scriptures that we've never seen before, our response should not be, well, I've never seen this in real life, so this can't be true, Lord. Instead, our response should be in submission to God's Word, saying, Lord, it's here in your Word. I know it's true. I've never seen it, but help me understand how I should think about it. So we see it here in God's Word. It's hard for us to imagine, but I want you to use your imagination for me. What what if you saw a man like this? What if you were driving down the street and you saw a man who who was living in a graveyard and he was screaming and he was crying out and he was cutting himself? I know me, I I think I would probably call the authorities. I would think, well, here's a man who's going to harm himself and he can harm others. This guy needs to be institutionalized. He needs help. And the people here in the country of the Gerasenes, they didn't know what to do with this guy either. So they tried to subdue him with chains, but he just broke through the chains. I'm sure they were frightened out of their minds. I'm sure they were scared. Even though it's hard for us to imagine, there are people like this in our day who are literally tormented like him, who have voices in their heads, who have violent tendencies, who are cutting themselves. And we usually classify it as just insanity or severe depression, but I'm sure that in many of these cases, not all, but many of these cases, this is demonic oppression. And similar to the townspeople in the story, we don't quite know what to do with them. So we do the same thing. We try to subdue them, though we have more modern ways to do it, like padded rooms and straitjackets and and medicines. But we're not really sure what to do with them. The cause for this particular guy's issues, though, is not just he had some traumatic incident as a child or he just had some screws loose. This guy's body is inhabited by demonic powers. And surely he doesn't want to live this way, but he's being oppressed. He's being uh, imprisoned. He's being tortured by these demons against his will. Brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be deceived. Demons are real. I mean, surely that would be one of the ways that they would seek to deceive us. Demons are real. Demons are are spiritual beings created by God, evil spiritual beings that God created that that work against his plans. In the Gospel of Mark, uh, more than any of the other Gospels, we see Jesus encounter these demons, these evil forces, face to face. Matter of fact, in chapter 1, we see uh, an incident that's almost exactly like this, where Jesus runs into a demon-possessed man, and it's almost kind of the same interaction where they they cry out and Jesus casts the demon out. So we see this this here, and when we see these demons, they're always trying to destroy humanity. In this particular case, they're trying to dehumanize this man. They they want this man to act like a beast, right? They want to... They want to strip the image of God off of this man. But this is what demons do. They work against and try to hinder God's good plan for his glory. I don't want you to think, though, that this is the only way that demons work, is by demonic possession. Don't be deceived in that way either. There are other ways that demons can work. Because we can be deceived and think that we have no real, we should never think about demons at all because we know as believers... We can't be possessed by demons. Our bodies are temple of the Holy Spirit, possessed by the Spirit of God. But there are still other ways that demons can influence. Of course, 
Demons can influence us and tempt us to sin. Of course, if we give in, it's our own sinful desire that's given in to them, but they can tempt us nevertheless. Uh, uh, 1 Timothy 4 talks about false teaching. It calls it the doctrine of demons. Well, there's one way that demons would love to influence our churches by letting false teaching get in. And if you look around our country, well, it seems like it's already happened quite a bit. So we should be aware of the spiritual warfare and the demonic activity that happens. And, of course, anytime we give in to the influence, it is our own responsibility. But demons are behind much of the evil that happens in our world. Demons are real. But let, let's get back to the man. Let's think about the man again. So th- these demonic forces in him are, are so strong that he's, he's breaking these chains and he's, he's living among the dead. He doesn't want to be among any living people. But when he sees Jesus step off that boat, what does he do? He runs and he falls before him. He runs right to Jesus and he falls before him. And so the passage gets a little tricky here. Because these demons have taken over his body, and and when he starts speaking, it seems to me like the text is suggesting that it's the demons speaking. But I think that when this man sees Jesus and he runs to him, I think the man is in control at this point. I think he sees Jesus and he knows this is his opportunity to be delivered from these demons that are torturing his body. I think he sees Jesus and he says, this is my chance. And we can learn something from the demon-possessed man here because he didn't know how anybody could deliver him, but somehow he knew who could deliver him. He wasn't quite sure how it would happen, but he saw Jesus, and somehow he knew that Jesus was the one to deliver him. And we can learn something from here there. Some of us need to stop clinging to our willpower and run to Jesus. Some of us need to stop clinging to our money and run to Jesus. Some of us need to stop clinging to our friends or any of our idols and just run to Jesus. We may not be sure how we're going to be delivered, but we should know absolutely who can deliver us. His name is Jesus. And and it's the same thing for any kind of, you know, mentally unstable people that we run into. We shouldn't just stigmatize them or ridicule them or just laugh at them. We should have compassion on them because many of them are oppressed just like this man was. More than anything, they need to be delivered. And we should serve them holistically, but more than anything, they need Jesus. Medicine can subdue us, and and counseling can help us think more clearly, but only Jesus can make us whole. We need to point folks to Jesus. So the man saw Jesus. He ran to Jesus. So Let me draw your attention to another part of the scene. Number two, the demons speak. Number two, the demons speak. So as the man runs and he he falls before Jesus, he says, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. The text says he, he cries that out because Jesus was saying, Come out of him, you unclean spirit. So this shows us, I think, that it's the unclean spirit that's speaking, as I think more of the dialogue will. And so we've already established that Jesus and these demons are not on the same side. They oppose him. So it's kind of strange then that these demons would respond like this. What have you to do with me? This would kind of be like a a war. Let's say uh, the United States, we're we're at war with some foreign country, and they have some some prisoners of war, some POWs, and and U.S. troops are going to go in to rescue these prisoners and say U.S. troops land on foreign soil, and they go to get these troops. And when they get there, the foreign country is like, "Ah, U.S. Army, what are y'all doing here? Please please don't mess with us. Please don't bother us. My bad. Now, you you would probably be thinking, now, that's that's an awkward response, because it would seem like this is a war. Shouldn't you be fighting instead of begging them not to mess with you? But that's exactly what the demons do here. They say, what, what have you to do with me? Why are you here? And I think this shows that this, this isn't a normal kind of war, right? This isn't a normal kind of battle. Uh, so I want to look at four things that we learn about the demon's relationship to Jesus based on this interaction. Number one, they know who he is. They know who Jesus is. 
The demons don't have to ask who Jesus is when he steps on the scene. As soon as they see him, they recognize him to be Jesus. And they don't just say he's Jesus. They say he's Jesus, the son of the most high God. They know what his status is. I mean, it sounds a lot like Peter's confession in Matthew 16 when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Jesus says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and Jesus calls him blessed because the Father revealed that to him. Well, this sounds a lot like that. What we have here is demons actually proclaiming the truth of God. They know who Jesus is. And it seems like they have more keen insight into spiritual things than any of the townspeople did. They knew exactly who Jesus was. And so I think this actually kind of shows us a frightening truth that you can know exactly who Jesus is but still not know him. You can know a lot about Jesus and still not know him. You can come to the Summit Church every single weekend. You could read your Bible every single day. You could be teaching a Bible study. You might be a student in seminary. You can know a lot about Jesus and still not know him. You shouldn't assume you know him because you know a lot about him. Knowing him has to do with a, a deep, intimate relationship, interacting and loving and trusting him at a deep level. Knowing about him is nothing more than memorizing facts, right? Memorizing facts is not what God has called us to do, and God is not impressed with your book smarts, right? You can say true things about God. Good job. So can demons. James chapter 2 says, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. If your knowledge of God has not led to a changed life, then you're no better than the demons. True faith shows up. Second thing this interaction with them shows us is they know that Jesus came to oppose them. They're, they're not under the illusion that Jesus is their friend that came to help them, right? They know that Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, came to bring the kingdom of God. They know that Jesus has come to do away with evil and he's come to make all things new. They know that that making all things new includes their destruction. They know that in the end, they'll be destroyed and that the Lord Jesus Christ will reign. They understand that they're enemies of the Lord Jesus. Number three, it shows they know that he's more powerful than them. Jesus asks, what is your name? They say legion. Now, legion was uh, five to 6,000 Roman soldiers. So I think that may be meant to show us that there were a lot of demons, maybe thousands of demons, and that may be why he had this superhuman strength and why the, the, the possession was so strong in this man. Yet, they plead for mercy, right? There's no fear in you if you know you're more powerful than your opponent. But I think they knew they didn't have a chance. Have you ever seen this? I, I used to see it all the time in high school where they're dudes who, they just talk a lot, and they think, they talk like they can beat anybody up. But then when a fight really comes before them, they, they don't really want to fight nobody. And so it'll, some will be about to go down, and they're like, man, you lucky this dude is standing in front of me. You lucky I can't get to you. Stay right there. You lucky I can't get to you. <laughs> don't move. Right? Just walking around in circles for about five minutes. And wh why is that? It's because they understand when it really comes down to it, they don't have a chance to win that fight. And it's the exact same thing. When the Lord Jesus steps down in front of them, they don't want anything to do with Jesus because they know they have absolutely no chance. They understand that Christ is far more powerful than them. So what we see here is a, a weak, defeated enemy begging for mercy. They know he's more powerful than them. Number four, they know that Jesus is their authority. Right? They know that Jesus is their authority. They realize that they have to ask him for permission, right? They, they ask him for permission to go into the pigs. It says Jesus gave them permission. You don't ask for permission from your equal, okay? You ask for permission from authority figures. They understand that he's above them. All throughout Scripture, evil forces need the permission of God to do anything. 
We think about the most infamous example of this in the scriptures, Satan and, and Job, and, and what Satan does to Job, and Satan needs God's permission to do that, right? And, and Satan can't go any further than God allows him to. These demons here, in the same way, cannot do anything without Jesus' permission because he is their authority. And it's that way with all evil forces. Can you think of what our world would be like if they didn't need God's permission or if God didn't restrain them? Surely demons would love to do to every single one of us what they did to this man. Surely they would love to torture all of us in that way, but God in his sovereignty has not allowed them to. And we should praise God for that. That's a good mercy of God that he's restrained them. But these demons are under his authority. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. These demons were created by Jesus and for Jesus. And even though they're rebelling against Jesus, at the end of the day, they're just little pawns in his plan to show off his glory. These demons are under the authority of Jesus. And we really get to see the power of Christ on display here. Just like in the scene before, they're in this boat, and the words of Jesus are what calms the wind and the waves. And, of course, we know that it's the Word of God that created the universe. And, and Hebrews tells us that Jesus holds the universe together by the Word of His power. In similar fashion, all it takes is the words of Jesus, come out of Him, you unclean spirit to deliver this man. The word of Jesus Christ is powerful, more powerful than the heaviest artillery. The most powerful force in all the universe is the word of God. And with his word, he's shown his lordship over creation and now over the demons and then even in the next story over death. Jesus' words are authoritative and they will be obeyed. Brothers and sisters, we have to believe with firm conviction that Jesus is actually the Lord of Lords, right? We say he's the Lord of Lords, but sometimes practically we feel like, well, he's the Lord over this stuff, but there are a couple things over here he's not really the Lord of. No, Jesus is actually the Lord of Lords and all authorities. He's the Lord over all things. There is no tree, there's no sound, there's no insect, there's no animal, there's no atheist, there's no Muslim, there's no Hindu, no Buddhist, no angel, no demon, no devil that's not inferior and under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's really the Lord of Lords. Undisputed. He's actually the Lord of Lords, and he may allow rebellion for a time, but he will bring all things under his feet, and we should praise him as the Lord of Lords. So let's keep moving. I want to draw your attention to a third thing. Number three, Jesus delivers the man. Jesus delivers the man. So by his powerful word, we talked about him, him casting those demons out, and he gave them permission to go into the pigs. Now, remember the last time these people saw this demon-possessed man, he was cutting himself, and he was crying out, and he was screaming and breaking chains. The next time they see him after his encounter with Jesus, he's sitting there clothed and in his right mind. That's what happens when somebody has an encounter with Jesus. He changes everything. He changes everything. Now, the people are blown away by this, what the Lord Jesus has done. And we see that Jesus, in his mercy, restored this man. Jesus came into the world to restore his creation that was so marred by sin and death to to bring the reign of God. And he's reconciling all things to the Father. And he shows mercy to this man. And this man, even though he, he was oppressed by these demons, he was a sinner like you and me. So he didn't deserve to be delivered, but Jesus did it out of his mercy. That's the beautiful thing about the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't deliver based on what we deserve. He delivers based on his mercy. If Jesus only delivered us when we deserved it, well, none of us would ever be delivered from anything. But the beauty of what God has done in Christ is it's all by grace and mercy. There's nothing so strong that Jesus doesn't have power over it, that he won't deliver, and all of his deliverance 
is an act of mercy. I'm not sure uh, what people are dealing with today. I'm, I'm not really sure what you came here wrestling through. I'm not sure what kind of sin struggles. I'm not sure what kind of addictions. I'm not sure what kind of difficult lifetimes. Maybe somebody here today is just wrestling through a difficult marriage. Maybe somebody here today is just wrestling through a, a time of bad health. I don't know what you're going through, but what I do know for sure is if there's nothing that Jesus cannot deliver us from, right? He's, he's the authority over all creation, and he can deliver us from anything. Maybe your situation looks hopeless. Maybe you've been feeling like you're never going to come out of this difficult season. Maybe, maybe you've been feeling like you're never going to overcome that sin. But I want you to know that Jesus is powerful enough to deliver us from absolutely anything. He is the Lord over all things. Once again, we may not know how we're going to be delivered, but we surely know who can do it, even, even when it looks helpless. And I would encourage you to plead with Jesus to do it in faith. Let me draw your attention to a fourth thing, number four. The people respond. The people respond. So in this story, not only has this demon-possessed man had an encounter with Jesus, but the entire town has. Right, can you imagine the people who actually watched this scene? Can you imagine how incredible that must have been? How mind-blowing it must have been to see this scene where these demons are are screaming at Jesus and he throws them in these pigs and these 2,000 pigs go over the cliff. And then even the people who didn't see it with their own eyes, those people went and told them about it. So the whole town has had an encounter with Jesus. How did everybody respond? How did everybody respond? Well, the townspeople were afraid. They'd never seen this kind of power and authority before. Maybe they're angry that Jesus ran uh, 2,000 of their pigs off the cliff. They they don't like him, right? The text says they beg him to depart from their region. Now, to us, that seems really strange. You, think you, you just saw this amazing act of mercy and authority and power, yet you're begging him to leave your region. But many people today don't like Jesus either, right? He disturbs our normal pattern of life. Jesus tends to make people uncomfortable. We would prefer little comfy Jesus in a box, but little comfy Jesus in a box doesn't exist. When Jesus steps on the thing, he shakes things up and he makes things uncomfortable. And if you're going to spend your life looking for that comfortable Jesus that won't disturb anything in your life, well, you're going to look for a long time because he doesn't exist. He demolishes darkness and he calls us into light. So that's how the townspeople responded. They begged him to leave. But what about the demon-possessed man? That demon-possessed man responds with gratitude and gratefulness. Matter of fact, instead of begging Jesus to depart from the region, he begs Jesus that he can can be with him, right? He wants to be with Jesus. Jesus doesn't let him know. He says, you know what? I want you to go and tell other people what the Lord has done for you. And so he he obeys him. He does what Jesus says. He goes out of gratitude and tells people what the Lord has done, and it says people marvel. Now, what we see from that man is, is the right response to an encounter with Jesus, But I want to ask you, when was the last time that you went and told somebody what the Lord has done for you? It doesn't have to be deliverance from demon possession. But surely the Lord has done amazing things in your life. When's the last time you told somebody about the sins that the Lord has delivered you from? When's the last time you told somebody about the amazing ways the Lord has grown you over the past couple years, about the community that you found in your church, about the the provision that God has been giving in your life? When was the last time you told somebody? When's the last time you told somebody that God delivered you from darkness into his marvelous light? It seems simple, but that's what happens when a heart is grateful for what God has done. When you're grateful for something that God has done, it overflows. And when you've experienced something that you want other people ex- to experience, you're compelled to tell them about it. So my prayer is that God would give us that kind of gratitude that overflows to the point where we feel compelled to say, hey, let me tell you what my Lord has been doing for me, even to the smallest things, even to the smallest things. 
So we think about those two responses, the townspeople and the, the demon-possessed man, they're polar opposites. But I think we see from the townspeople that it's possible to witness the grace and the authority and the power of Jesus and to still not be his disciple. It's, it's, it's possible to witness that firsthand and to still not be his disciple. Some people respond with confusion or hostility. Some people just respond with applause. But none of those are the response that God calls for. I think about Colossians 2.15. It says about Jesus, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. What Paul talks about there is as another standoff that Jesus had with the forces of evil. Though Jesus had many battles with the forces of evil throughout the gospel of Mark, his ultimate triumph over evil happened at the end of Mark's gospel at the cross. On the cross, it seemed like Jesus had been defeated for a moment. It seemed like maybe evil would win, but he would rise with all power, defeating sin, defeating death, and defeating the devil. At the cross, Jesus put these demonic rulers and authorities to open shame. He embarrassed them. He he showed how little they were. He, He dealt the final blow in advance. So all their rebellion, they can cause as much evil as they want to now, but all of it's in vain because the battle has already been won. Jesus has already won the battle. It's now everything they do is in vain. It's almost like, in a a smaller way, uh, the Republican primaries where all these guys are still giving speeches and you just wanted to tap them on the shoulder like, hey, I I think Mitt Romney got this, bro. I think this is over. (laughs) You you can't get enough enough delegates on it. It's a wrap. And and they're still getting all these speeches, and you're saying, hey, this is in vain. But in a similar fashion, here these demons and these evil forces still working against God, and all of it's in vain because it's already abundantly clear who the victor is. His name is Jesus. So you can do everything you want to, but Christ has already dealt the final blow. And when Jesus returns finally, he will put all his enemies under his feet. Now, this is the ultimate work of Jesus against evil when Jesus went to the cross. And not only just forces of evil, but even the evil that occurs in every single one of our hearts are sin. We should be more worried about standing before God in judgment than we are about demonic forces. Every single one of us will have to stand before God in judgment. And the good news is that the Lord Jesus took that sin head on when he went to the cross. The Lord Jesus bore sins that everybody who would put their faith in him could be forgiven of those sins. He defeated sin for us, and he rose from the grave. So I want to ask you, how are you going to respond to that work of triumph over evil? Are you going to, like the townspeople, ask Jesus to leave you alone? You don't like that he's calling you to repent and believe? You don't like that he wants to stir up your life? Or are you going to, like the demon-possessed man, run to him, fall before him, trust in him, and beg to be with him? Will you turn from your sin and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the proper response to that victory over evil. I want you to ask yourself how you've responded. I don't know about you, but when I read this text, I think that's the kind of Lord I want to follow. The kind of Lord with that kind of power and with that kind of authority and with that kind of grace and and mercy and holiness, that's the kind of Lord that I want to follow. And any of us can follow him. So like I said at the beginning, I think there is a battle between good and evil going on. But I don't think it's a fair fight. And we do not have to wait till the story ends to know how it's going to end. Jesus has already won. Now, good and evil is more at the forefront of our our minds this weekend than it would be on a typical weekend. Because what we've just witnessed in our country is one of the worst acts of evil in the history of our country. And when stuff like this happens, you're, you're forced to ask yourself, well, how could anybody do anything that evil? And then you're forced to ask yourself, what is God going to do about that? We should be grieved, and we should be angry, but we should not be deceived to think that in any way evil has somehow gotten the upper hand again. 
Well, absolutely not. The Lord Jesus still reigns. And the Lord Jesus will do away with all evil. And the Lord Jesus will put all of his enemies under his feet. Jesus really is the Lord of Lords. That's why I encourage you to run to him, to, to fall before him, to trust in him, to praise him, and to tell others about what he's done. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the matchless name of Jesus, praising you for your word. We thank you for your word, Father, and we we thank you for showing us how majestic and, and powerful the Lord Jesus is, Father, and we pray that you would give us grace to trust in him. We thank you so much, God, for this opportunity to worship you. And pray, Lord, that as we continue, we would worship you from a heart's posture that submits to that, Lord. I pray that if there's anybody here who does not know you, Lord, that you would show them Christ in a way they've never seen him before, that you would open their eyes to see that, Lord of lords. And pray, Father, to give us grace to exalt Jesus in the rest of our time. In Jesus' name, amen.